15th. Um, if we would stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. Um, we have one adjustment to the agenda, and that is um, prior to communications, we have uh, two high school students here who were just elected to um, be our representatives from the high school, so they will speak. Um, are there any other adjustments? Um, and approval of the school board minutes um, from August 28th. Are there any adjustments or changes? Okay, then we can move on to our two newly elected high school students. And will you state your name for us, please? Yes, my name's Rebecca Taylor, and I'm a senior. Um, everyone seems to have adjusted well to the new school year, and the Cape Coalition is sponsoring a student body ice cream social this Sunday in the cafeteria, actively trying to create a positive relationship between freshmen and the upperclassmen. And Mr. Shedd's announcements on the first day included an emphasis on respect. And as a high school, we're trying to be respectful of one another and ensure that everyone is comfortable being their self in our school. The ad drop period for semester classes has gone by, and so people have settled into their classes. There's been a slight uproar over the lack of caffeinated, caffeinated beverages in the soda machines, but otherwise students seem content and have gotten to know their new teachers. There are new teachers in practically every department, and my new physics teacher, Mr. Whitehead, has brought a little Virginian appeal to the mathematically demanding subject of physics. I'm sure the other new teachers have been welcomed as well. In fact, another new teacher to Cape, Miss Lamb, is going to be the faculty Bartleby advisor this year. The Bartleby is our school arts and literary publication. This brings me to the subject of other extracurriculars. Last year's state-winning mock trial team is holding their first meeting tonight, and the book talk group has already met and discussed their summer reading. The art club has begun working with metal and crafting jewelry with a guest teacher. Speech and debate will meet Thursdays, and the volunteer club will hold their first monthly meeting at the end of September. Theater Council and Tech Thursdays are also meeting and getting ready to keep up the momentum that the Fringe Festival inspired in the theater program. Even Yearbook is already in gear, preparing to distribute the 2004 edition this June. It seems far away, but I'm sure it will sneak up on me, especially since I'm a senior. If this small sampling of after-school activities wasn't enough, students are also heavily involved in sports this fall season. The soccer, football, field hockey, golf, and cross-country programs are all in full swing. And the, the cross-country team is especially proud of Elise Moody Roberts for her finish at the race in Gorham last Friday, where she established a course record and earned a time that ranks her nationally. I could go on about how busy we are at the high school, but I'm sure that the school board's busy as well. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. That was great. I'm Michael Iris, and I'm also a senior at Cape Elizabeth High School. I'll be a student representative. And following on what uh, Rebecca said, uh, we're all excited for the new year. We had some uh, victories in sports, like the boys' soccer team and the girls' soccer team had a tie. The football team won, and the boys' cross-country team had five in the top ten. Some issues that the uh, SAC in the preliminary meeting uh, brought up were the overcrowding of the school, especially the cafeteria during our first lunch the lack of caffeinated beverages, food prices, all of which seem to be centered around food. Um, the theme this year, again, is respect, and it's between both students and teachers and students and uh, students, and we all have uh, many uh, meetings on that, and we look forward to a uh, festive homecoming, and we, we have already designated a committee to plan the uh, activities, and that is all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. And we look forward to both of you reporting to us every month of the school year. Um, we can move on to communications. There's a, a fall conference coming up on October 23rd and 24th. Uh, and with the, um, for those, many of you have been to the conference every year, but um, if you could let Mary know as soon as possible. Uh, so that we could send the registration for those of you who are going to attend the MSMA fall conference 
and this is sampling of what the workshop are in your packet. Um, also, I, I passed out just before the meeting uh, uh, an article that was in today's paper uh, regarding a study that was done about uh, M, uh, MEA scores in 33 elementary schools in Maine out of 376 that, that scored above the state average in all areas, and Pine Cove School was on that list, so I wanted to make sure you all saw that. Um, and I have um, one other piece of, of information. I received uh, a letter from a parent in the high school. And actually, I would like to read this letter to everyone. Um, on Friday, September 12th, I will describe the incident that occurred outside the high school entranceway at about 7.15 a.m. on that same day. I was heading north on Route 77 and was the third in line of vehicles attempting to turn left into the high school entranceway. To my left, I noticed a young boy appearing to be of middle school age, riding his bike north on the left side of the road. The line of traffic heading south was not moving and was backed up nearly to the police station. Suddenly, an impatient driver pulled out of the southbound traffic lane, driving down the center of Route 77 to pass the four cars in front of him. The driver then cut over to the proper southbound lane in front of the high school entranceway. At this moment, the young boy on a bike was attempting to cross the exit lane of the high school. The vehicle narrowly missed hitting the boy on his bike. Fortunately, the boy on the bicycle saw the oncoming vehicle and quickly swerved his bike to keep from being struck by this vehicle. This is the third consecutive year I have been driving my children to the high school. The above cited incident is by no means an isolated event. Time after time, I see drivers of all ages attempt to enter and exit the high school during crowded and rushed traffic conditions. Many use good judgment and drive safely. However, many more use poor judgment and pull out of the high school into oncoming traffic in a dangerous manner. I often see similar hazardous situations when cars pull out of the high school attempting to merge into the northbound lane and narrowly miss having a collision with impatient drivers or cyclists who are using the breakdown lane as a passing lane. During the brief peak traffic periods at the start and end of each school day, I frequently see vehicles occupying all four lanes of Route 77, both travel lanes and breakdown lanes. Couple this density of traffic along with the rush nature of people getting to school and work on time, as well as students biking and walking to school, and you see all of the ingredients for a tragedy. I am aware of the many studies and discussions concerning this safety matter. I feel that it is time for Cape Elizabeth to take a positive step towards the safety of our students and their parents. Um, and the reason that, that I, I read this letter is uh, we received a letter uh, last spring um, basically to the same effect. And, and there was a committee uh, that was formed with school board members, parents, um, our police chief, town manager, and town council members. And um, from that committee, well I, guess, well, I can let Tom speak to the committee and, and what was done. Um, but, but I think here is another letter, another incident. A and I think... Um, rather than all of us being aware of the situation, um, we need to take care of it. Um, and as a school board, you know, I'm looking to you guys um, for some input as to how we should handle this. And Tom, could you speak Well, the committee um, last year um, came up with what the, op the, the best solution would be, and there were two which are, were both deemed to be um, very costly. One was to place um, a policeman to direct traffic in the morning um, and or the afternoon, and the other was to install a traffic light. Um, but both of those items um, are very expensive. 
So what we did do in the interim was to allow traffic to enter the high school via Jordan Way um, by the, the fire station um, in, in the hopes that that would take some of the traffic out of that, that central area. Um, but obviously, um, it seems to be still happening. And, and Maria is, is, is right that, that we know about it and probably something needs to be done about it. And, um, and, and although costs are a factor, um, if someone gets hurt, then I, I wouldn't feel good that we're sitting here um, talking about how much it would cost to station someone out there for 10 minutes a day as opposed to the, the, the health and safety. So it probably needs to be addressed again. Now, the, the, the question is, whose responsibility is it? And that's maybe something we can work jointly with on the town side. As I see, you know, the traffic is um, created because of the school, um, but it's Route 77. Um, so maybe we need to open up that conversation again. Um, Tom, th this letter, you know, copies of this letter were sent to um, Jeff Shedd, Nancy Hutton, Tom Eismeyer, Mike McGovern, um, and yourself. And um, w do you think that um, possibly you and I would meet with Mary Ann Lynch and Mike McGovern? Yeah, I, I think that's probably this. We know what the solution is. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's, that's, we don't need to investigate it all over again. We know what the problem is. We know um, what the solution is. Um, so probably that would be the next thing we have to do because what we did last year didn't make the problem go away. Right, and Kevin, you were on that committee, correct? Well, um, it's, it's something I've dealt with many times in the past. I mean, we're taking a penny ante solution to a potential tragedy. And if we have one child injured or hurt, um, you know, we, we have to keep plugging away at it. We don't have any jurisdiction over the money. Uh, all we can, can do is continue to bring it to uh, the council's attention. Okay. Um, I, I'd just like to add that um, it came to uh, notice for myself that on the website there was uh, an article citing that the town council had a goal this year to review roadway and pedestrian safety uh, in the town center. Um, and to that end, they uh, have hired uh, Wilbur Smith Associates, who's, who monitored traffic at some key spots, one of which was the entrance to the high school. Uh, the dates that they were there, uh, according to the article, were September 8th, 6 a.m. to noon on Tuesday, September 9th, um, and then also on Wednesday, September 10th, and Thursday, September 11th. So they missed the, uh, the near miss mm -hmm. on, the, on the 12th. But, um, I guess my request would be that um, we ask the town council to be a part of that discussion uh, when they get the results back from the firm um, and also um, to ask them this year to not let cost be the deciding factor but that safety for our students and teachers and citizens uh, be the main reason for their recommendation. Anyone else? Okay. Then, I, then, then, Tom, I will set up that meeting between Marianne, Mike, yourself, and myself. Uh, and now, Marie, before we move sorry. forward, what? I have one before we move. Um, I have a meeting uh, with the brand new administration at Portland Arts and Technical High School on Monday. If there are any issues or concerns, um, if your guidance folks have any issues or concerns since their guidance department was reduced by half. Um, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me by sometime Friday so I can inject those issues into my conversations. There will also be a meeting of the General Advisory Committee of Portland Arts and Technical next Thursday. Have you received notice on that, Tom? Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other communications? Um, comments from the public? Do we have any? Nothing that came to me. Nothing. Um, then we will move on to recognition. And tonight we have um, Kathy Walsh, and we are recognizing her for her uh, year on the school board.
think um, Kathy Walsh, when she spent her year on the school board, she just remembered how much she loved uh, teaching again. So she's now with us in the classroom. So uh, we still have Kathy, but um, we do want to recognize you and thank you for the, for the time that you did put into the school board and how much everything you did was appreciated. and your guidance and your honesty because you set a tone for all of us that is hard to reach but always worth striving towards. Um, it was a privilege for me to work with all of you on the school board. I think many people forget that you're volunteers, that the time that you commit to this organization is absolutely priceless and the work and commitment that you give it has no bounds and I have so much admiration and respect for that um, having served with many of you. Um, I certainly enjoyed the time because it gave me a chance to be connected with education at a time when I couldn't be in the classroom, but I must admit I'm thrilled to be back in the classroom. So I thank you for serving with you and the time as well as the chance to come back. And for anyone who's listening, um, I hope people will read the recommend, uh, recommendations for the um, referendums very, very carefully and support the work for the, uh, both of the editions. It's a really important thing for all of us, and I want to be sure people know where I stand on that. Um, and I do hope that you'll excuse me because I have school work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. And we can move on to the superintendent's report. I have a few items I'd just like to quickly go through and, and single out some, some issues um, that we've come across in the opening of school. Um, and the first one, if you notice in your packet, you also have your, the uh, enrollment report, as you always receive. Um, what's interesting, though, about, about this year's September enrollment um, are the increase in numbers when the predictions were that our enrollment was going to begin to decrease. Um, what's of concern is the, the school that had the biggest increase is Pond Cove, so obviously those kids stay with us. Um, we tend not to lose kids once they, once they enter our school system. Um, our enrollment last year at this time uh, was 1781. Uh, we started the year at 1803. The projection was for 1765. So just in one year of what the projection was, we are 38 students um, over um, what, what they were projecting just a year ago where we'd be. Um, and I, I just think it's something we have to constantly monitor. Um, it, does, it does have an impact. Um, for, for years to come, as far, especially with those kids that are of kindergarten age where we saw the biggest, the biggest increase. One of the things that I've, I've, I've tried to do in talking to um, the assessor's office is to take a look at um, the housing and uh, the sale of, of not new homes but the older homes and what's actually happening because we often talk about um, you know, people without children are leaving those homes and, and uh, people with children are buying those homes. So we never have any, any data to back that up. So I don't know, know the best way to do it, but we do have a listing of all those, those, um, those sales and we're hoping to be able to track down so we can actually get a, get a handle on, you know, help us for years to come. What, the, what is there a certain percentage um, so that we would know that in a given year um, of so many sales, if we track it over time, we would be able to predict with a bit more accuracy um, in the older homes, is there a certain percentage that year after year tend to be turned over to people with children? Uh, I think it's, it's data that's worth looking at. Um, with the Future Direction Planning Initiative, which is going to be a big issue this year, um, um, there will be a team that will review the data. Um, the facilitator who was at our workshop in August is going to give us a report um, and there will be a team put together to review that report, take a look at our strategic goals and the information from the workshop. And I do need, I think Susan Steinman was um, the representative to that group, so I'll need a, a person from the school board to, to represent the school board on the future direction planning team. Another issue as we start the year, uh, which is directly related to enrollment, um, but it has to do with class size and more in terms of teacher load. Um, you know, we're, we're noticing um, 
is at the high school this year the middle school has always had a large teacher loads you know research will say that a teacher in a school should not have in a secondary school or anywhere from seventh grade on up more than eighty students were well beyond that most of the middle school teachers in seventh and eighth grade have over a hundred students and the high school now is approaching that number also so it's something that we've increased because of budget constraints over the last couple of years but i think it's really getting to the point where um, we'll have an impact on instruction um, so that's something that I, I bring up now because it'll probably come up again during the, the budget deliberations um, we have a very busy year coming up as you know um, the district leadership team has met on a few occasions talked about some of the issues that we know are important to the district uh, the local assessments and creating those common assessments will continue um, we also did just receive notice from the commissioner um, that she will be making a recommendation to hold on one year for one year um, the chapter 127 requirement that the present uh, ninth grade class be the class that's held to the standard for for graduation and that she's suggesting it be the present eighth grade class to give school districts another year uh, to prepare for that also in terms of the requirements that uh, the essential programs and services model hold um, have come in after the fact and they're supposed to be tied together so it, it, it really needs another year um, to gel no child left behind will be something that we continue to address this year um, I will be attending a regional workshop from the, uh, the Education Commission of the States uh, that I was asked today actually to attend um, with a group of superintendents from Maine where they're putting together a group of superintendents and also a group of legislators from the different states to talk about the impact of No Child Left Behind, uh, which we're still uh, learning about um, all the time because it's a, it's, it's a far-reaching bill that has major impact on the schools. And lastly, one of the goals that, that I wanted to bring up now that you'll hear again at budget time and as we go throughout this year is the goal of reaching all kids. We talk about that a lot. Um, it's one of our belief statements that we will reach all kids, and I think this year we're committed to that. We're committed to, to bringing to the school board the kinds of programs or teaching techniques or professional development that is necessary to actually do that. Um, and it's a real commitment on the part of the district leadership team to, to make that happen. Um, just, when was it, just last week, a group of us uh, the principals and Marie attended. We went to a consortium meeting in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, you've heard us talk about this consortium, which is a group of, of high-performing um, schools that are, that are similar in size, similar in socioeconomic makeup from different parts of the country. The group started um, with um, a superintendent from Clayton, Missouri, and one from Palisade School District outside of uh, Philadelphia, and myself. Uh, we met um, the summer before this summer and had a conversation about what it would be like to bring like school districts together to challenge each other, to bring, to bring each of us to, to another level. Um, we wanted to expand the group, and this meeting we had in St. Louis uh, was the first meeting of the, the expanded group which now includes Wayland, Massachusetts, Edina School District, and I don't know if that's the town or the district, um, which is a suburb of Minneapolis, and Whitefish Bay, which is a suburb of Milwaukee. Um, we visited an early childhood program um, when we were in Clayton. Um, we also watched a video conferencing program that they have um, working in their middle school and visited a wonderful town center um, which was a joint effort by the town and school, which included unbelievable facilities um, that you'd have to see it to, to believe it. I mean, with uh, basketball courts and rock climbing walls and um, uh, a fitness center that's, as, that's as, as big as any private one I've seen. Um, and two pools, one, uh, one pool just for little kids with it's a multi size and said uh, uh, slides and everything else like in a water park and another one that's a, a 
a traditional uh, Olympic pool for, for, for swimming in. Um, but what was nice about this town center is when we had lunch there and there was a senior group there, um, there were high school kids because they could walk over uh, from the high school and eat lunch there because there was a subway inside of this facility. Um, and there were people from the center of town, business people who were on their lunch break working out. Um, so it really said to us that the intergenerational thing can work. Um, they had people of all ages in the same facility at the same time doing all kinds of things, and it worked. The seniors worked with, with, the, with the high school students, um, with the business people who probably some of them weren't even from that community. Um, but it was just nice to see because we talk about that a lot and wonder whether or not um, you know, we can have activities at the same time or any kind of community activity. Well, do the seniors really want the kids around and all? But boy, in this particular facility, it looked like it was working. Um, so that was nice to see. Well, we're, what, we're, what we shared is we shared about our laptop initiative, the Renaissance program at the high school, and lesson study at Pond Cove. So this consortium is really an opportunity for the districts to share, um, but also down the road, it's something where we hope to really push each other um, and have some very open conversations about where we want to go with school districts. The next step in, in the consortium will be a meeting of the superintendents from each of the districts to really put together a plan um, set a vision and really talk about what the focus of, of the consortium should be um, and set some, maybe set some goals um, for the group and then, the, then to meet again um, centered around those in the spring of next year. So we're making progress with that and I think there has a, is an awful lot of potential and, and as I said, Marie and the three principals were, all, were also there. Um, and lastly, um, I just wanted to bring to your attention, I don't know if you're aware, um, the MMA proposal, and, and as you probably know, there are uh, two competing proposals that will be on a referendum um, in, in, in November. Uh, there is a governor's proposal that, that deals with school funding. There is a main municipal proposal. Um, we have um, just preliminary information um, but there is a meeting uh, MMA is sponsoring, and the closest one is on Thursday at Keeley's at 7 o'clock, where MMA will be presenting and discussing their proposal. Now, just on the surface, they've given us data, and this is their data. Their goal is to raise the funding um, the state provides for education to the 55% level that was promised um, years back. Um, if the, MAA, if the MMA proposal passes, um, hold on your hats, um, they're saying that we would receive another $2.4 million um, if it went up to the 55%. The question everyone asks, has is, where will that money come from? Um, so that's what I would like to get some answers to. Um, but boy, it sure looks good to, to see the numbers. If the governor's proposal passes from the preliminary figures, that is with no additional um, increase in the money, which now the figures we, they gave us does not increase the funding at all, the overall funding package for next year, and there would be and no cushions, we would lose $700,000 more. Um, but again, that's the worst case scenario on a governor's program, which is the essential programs and services. We would, we would continue to lose money with that particular program. Um, so there's a lot to learn in a short period of time about the proposals. As we get information, I, I think it's, it's our duty to, to let people know, but a lot of it is still up in the air and all of these are preliminary figures, but um, they're interesting to say the least. That's it. That's it. And we can move on to the principal's reports. Tom Panko. Good evening. Well, we're two weeks into the school year. From what I've seen and from all reports, things are going really well at Pond Cove. Uh, my annual thanks to Sue Weatherby and the whole transportation department for getting the kids to and fro school so safely. 
Uh, Tom mentioned the enrollment, current enrollment. I think we, you can see from the figures that we were wise to add that half section of kindergarten because that was the kindergarten sections within our um, guidelines for class size and was the same thing for grade one. We had uh, 22 kids enter grade one in between kindergarten and first grade, which puts the first grade with seven sections right at the bottom level of our class size guidelines. It also means that we are now still fully using, because we have the occupational therapy room, all the classrooms at Pond Cove, every single one. So we're, we're full. Um, looking forward a little bit, Monday is our first late start day. And uh, Kelly Hassan, the teacher leader, is going to follow up on the spelling investigation work that a committee worked on this summer. Um, so we'll, we'll be doing that. Uh, Kelly's uh, gotten the agenda together. We're going to look at the research and go forward with that. And I should add, just two weeks into the year, it's been a pleasure working with Kelly. She's added a new dimension to teaching and learning at Pond Cove. So this model may actually work. Um, part of our ongoing work with the reading and writing, or literacy as we call it, not just internally but for the local assessment system, Becky Swift, Deborah Jordan Pearson, and Suzanne Hamilton, our three reading recovery teachers, invited uh, all comers to a brush up sec uh, session on doing running records. It's just a mechanism for getting information on how kids read. Nineteen teachers showed up for an hour after school yesterday to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, I, that's very impressive. I did bring the article that Tom mentioned about uh, Pontco being among the schools doing really well in MEA. Uh, the, the statistics, I think you can take or leave, but it, there is an important sub-headline. It says, a study of Maine's top-ranked elementary schools proves intervention schools and good teachers are the keys to success. I happen to agree with that. I think the uh, reading recovery teachers are a great example of that. Uh, again, upcoming events, uh, our open houses start Thursday. Because of the feedback we got last year, it was very positive. We've uh, adopted the same format again of more of an informal community and communication building between parents and teachers, and kids are invited to come uh, to show this, their parents around the classroom and around the school. Grades two and four are Thursday night, one and three are next Monday night. And I should add for any listeners and viewers that Tom and Marie will be doing a uh, a presentation on the upcoming referendum uh, at 6.30 on both nights. Any questions, questions for Tom? Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, Jeff, the high school. I don't really do this in the principal's reports typically, uh, but I did want to highlight some, some wrap-up sort of data from last year in terms of the accomplishments of both this year's senior class and last year's senior class because there is some fairly remarkable information uh, based on test scores and things. And I share this recognizing that um, the accomplishments of our students are not obviously strictly um, or even primarily a tribute to the high school teachers. It's a tribute to the families, to the kids, and to the teachers K through 12 uh, about uh, that our students benefit from. Um, but there are some remarkable things. There are five semifinalists in this year's national merit semifinalists in this year's uh, senior class, which is a outstanding number. Um, we got AP score reports from this past year's senior class, and also some of the students who are currently still in school. Um, and I think there's some remarkable statistics that 94% of our students who took AP exams and most of our students who take, most of our students who take AP courses do take AP exams, unlike in some schools. But 94% of all those who did take an AP exam received a score of three or higher, which is considered to be a passing score, which is very strong. 62% uh, received scores of fours or fives uh, on the exam, which is also very impressive. Fours and fives typically are the scores that will result in college credit if, if schools participate in that part of the AP program. And I have to single out uh, our calculus students. Um, 19 out of 19 of our calculus students received fours or fives, which is an unbelievable number. Um, our SAT scores, uh, again, they'll probably go down this year. and. <laughs> Maybe I, maybe I will, maybe I won't report on it <laughs> this time next year, but <coughs> our, eight, our SAT scores are up in one year. Well, in math, are up 18 points in five years, 
uh, and up 21 points over last year in one year, our math scores, which is pretty amazing. Um, our mean score is for math is 595, which I think is the, I believe it's the highest in the state of Maine, but I may be wrong. Uh, for public schools, it's 76 points higher than the national average. Um, our verbal scores are up four points in the last five years, um, and they're 55 points over the national average. Um, I think they bear mentioning, and I've really never mentioned it before in three years, so I thought I would mention it now, that uh, our kids do really well by some really standard measures. Um, the class of 2007, our freshman class, has come in, I think, with a real positive attitude. I'm very impressed with them. I uh, enjoy having them in the school. And we do have homecoming coming up on October 4th. There will be a number of activities. We're actually going to try to squeeze in, um, talking about intergenerational, um, we're going to be having the traditional athletic activities in the morning, and we've negotiated with the soccer folks the annual alumni game to happen in the <coughs> evening with our students there and alumni and folks from different generations to be followed immediately thereafter by our dance, uh, which will be starting a little bit later than it normally does so that we can accommodate all those things. I also do want to mention um, that, yes, we had our school photographs taken on Friday morning. And I have to mention this, and it sounds kind of corny, but the photographer who was in charge, who had no sales representative responsibilities, took the trouble to come up to my office after, and this is two, two flights beyond which she had to walk. She didn't need to come up to my office to talk about uh, her experience with photographing Cape Elizabeth High School students. But she walked up two stairs to my office and she said, I cannot leave Cape Elizabeth High School without telling you as principal, that, that is the nicest, most respectful group of students we have ever dealt with. And the photographers go from Aristic County to York County and everywhere in between. And it sounded like a very genuine comment not somebody who wants to keep our business because they've been having our business for a lot of years. It wouldn't have made any difference whatsoever. <laughs> um, so I thought that was kind of a neat thing. And I do want to highlight, um, particularly with Michael still here, um, he mentioned we've had a lot of academic uh, athletic success so far this year. I do want to highlight uh, the Cape Elizabeth High School football team, which had its first ever victory now that it's a regular program out of the developmental league in, uh, in Class C. Um, they beat Trape Academy this past weekend, and an outstanding result. So that's my principal's report. Questions? Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Nancy, middle school. Good evening. We're also off and running and having a grand time at the middle school. Uh, we have completed our curriculum nights. We had them September 3rd and 4th, and want to thank all of the parents who came out. They were very well attended. We're always looking for feedback, though, um, as we try to structure those to be as informative and effective as possible. So any parents who might be listening, if they have comments or thoughts about the curriculum nights, if they could email me or just call, we would appreciate that feedback. We had a brief discussion about it at our team leaders meeting last week, and we're just looking to see if we've figured out the right way to do it or not. There is a tremendous amount of information to share with everybody in one night. So we realize there's a lot to listen to um, and to do that, but we're just trying to figure out the best way to do that. Our athletic season is off to a great start. Most of the teams started, um, pra they started practicing last week and they're well underway with games and excitement. So it's great to see the seventh graders out there participating in some of their first sports. Um, and for our sixth graders, as usual, um, Joe Doan and Jerry McQueenie have a large group of energetic runners who are participating in the cross-country program. The seventh grade students are getting ready to head off to their Camp Kiev experience, which they will be gone from school from October 6th through the 10th. So we're getting all of those things ready. I'm looking forward to that. For our fifth grade students, uh, life is very exciting because tomorrow night they get to pick up their band instruments. So if you live in the neighborhood with a fifth grader um, over the weekend, you may hear some wonderful beginning band sounds coming out. And uh, Terry White promises that by next March, the sounds will even be better. But they will be excited. On September 8th, we did get all the laptops out to everyone. 
and the eighth graders have been um, taking them home as that could come in from information last year. We are beginning this week on Friday morning with our parent informational laptop meetings for seventh grade parents and new eighth grade families. Um, if they would like to um, have take-home privileges for their sons and daughters. And we have a morning meeting on the 19th, and we have two evening meetings, the 24th and the 30th of September. Parents and students only need to come to one, but we're just trying to match with people's busy schedules and offer several different times that they could come and join us. As Marie mentioned, I believe, earlier on um, at our October meeting, we will have our student council representatives here to report to you. Our elections are this Thursday. Students will be giving speeches first thing in the morning to the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, and then voting will occur right after that. So they'll be all ready to go, and I already checked with Michael and Rebecca, and they agreed to be mentors for them next time, so they'll know all about reporting to the school board. And finally, I'm just to leave with you, I have a copy for each one of you. This is um, part of a copy. It just came out. In fact, Jill Bell just got it last night. And this is from the Educational Enterprise Zone, which is known as EZ, and it's the consortium that she belongs to for video conferencing. She started this on her sabbatical several years ago, continued to work with them, and this is one of their first publications about all of their video conferencing consortiums where they pick several schools to highlight their case studies. And Jill wrote an article for this, and Cape Elizabeth Middle School is in it, so um, the magazine is quite thick. What she has copied for you is the cover article just about what the consortium is, and then also a copy of her um, case study just for your perusal at your leisure. Thank you. And thank you. I think that's it. I have a quick question. Um, Nancy, c um, can you share with us, um, apparently there was a meeting that you had with parents um, regarding the Kiev conflict. Um, what was the outcome, and do we have any other plans for um, other years? Uh, we don't have plans for other years um, yet at this particular time. That's something probably I would like to talk with some members of the board about at some time. Have mentioned it as a think about for the 7th and 8th grade, um, actually just the 7th grade advisors. But right now they're focused on going off for this year. The result of our meeting, and I mentioned this in the memo that I submitted to you on August 22nd when I asked for your permission about fundraising and information about overnight stays, then unfortunately this year we do conflict with a holiday, with a religious holiday. We did have a meeting. We are going to be sending up a bus um, departing from the school grounds at 6.30 a.m. on Tuesday um, for families who would like to take advantage of that. And we do have one of our staff members right now, Brian Frichero, is planning to ride that bus. So he'll arrive at Kiev with the students and get them all located with their cabins and um, to put their things in. The plan is that we feel if we leave about 6.30, we should get to Kiev at 8.30. And that's when they've finished breakfast and they've gone back to the cabins for a few minutes. And then they do sort of a morning meeting at 8.45. And our other students would be able to join everybody in their advisory group at that time. So um, would the intention be that in the future that we would re remain with this week d despite any conflict for some of these kids? Or? I, I think it's a, probably a, a more involved conversation than, and than just to report out. There are some very good points to consider. There are variables to consider in that the fall holidays do move around. They're not on the same dates. Yeah. Um, that we did have some issues when we went very late in the year after Thanksgiving, which that week right now is occupied by someone else. I have had a brief conversation with Bob Grant, who's the header of, head of the Leadership Decisions Institute that we take part in. And um, when I get to Kiev, we'll talk about what the other kinds of dates are, but there are some weather concerns. It also impacts our music program as to when we can have a music concert. Um, as well, too. And all of these things have different values and different things, but there are many different perceptions to be heard and for a public school to make a decision um, about what's best to do on a school day. And um, so I think that is a discussion um, that we need to have, and we need to invite you know, opinions and thoughts from other people as well. And then I would certainly like to at least maybe talk with the policy committee about um, some particular issues um, to do this, because I do for many of our school activities. Um, if there are holidays that are very important to 
a significant number of our population, and I don't know what significant means, but it, to a, a number of our population, then you know, one of the things to put forth is perhaps we shouldn't be in school that day. Then. But I think those are decisions and discussions for us to have. But they will, they were planning on having them at some point. Um, I, I would hope that, you know, this is sort of my thing to Jennifer too, maybe that that's something that we could put on at some particular time. Nancy, I'm sorry, but I, I didn't look at my calendar. What holiday are we interfering with it Yom Kippur? It interferes with Yom Kippur, yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Now we can move on to the committee reports. Um, the finance subcommittee, we, we didn't get through our finance meeting tonight. Um, and the, the one thing that we did talk about, um, Gary will again present um, a new data management system next. Um, Elaine, is there anything else? Well, no, we signed warrants. <laughs> okay. Um, so we will finish our finance subcommittee meeting immediately after um, this meeting. Um, and the policy subcommittee. Jennifer? Um, there's nothing to report at this time. Our uh, first meeting is uh, next Tuesday, October, not next Tuesday, but Tuesday, October 7th at noon in the Jordan Conference Room. Um, then we'll move to unfinished business. Um, Gary? If I may, um, last, last year during our, our budget deliberations, we had a discussion about uh, an appropriate data management system that would work for us K-12. Um, the district leadership team has been investigating several options. Last year, the concern from the school board um, was whether or not the system that we would choose would meet the requirements and be compatible with whatever direction the state is going because we need to report learning results and assessments um, through, with that data to the State Department. So um, we've had a lot of discussion. What we are asking today, and, and, and as Gary discusses it, um, is your permission um, to move forward if, we've, if, if the system that we're looking at uh, gets a consensus approval um, from the district leadership team. We are meeting on uh, the 24th of this month uh, to have further discussions. Um, we would be eligible for some discounts if we move um, sooner rather than later, but also it is an important decision that, that we're not, gonna, not going to make in haste. Um, but if, if this is the decision and the way the district leadership team would like to go, we would just like your approval to, to, to move forward with it. So uh, Gary has a few remarks though, about it. Sure, I'll just, I'll just read a few things. Um, student information systems, software that lead, let school enter scores, track um, grades, demographic information, attendance, and things like that. They, they've been around for years. We're actually using three systems on our district. I think you've heard me say this before. We have a custom-built uh, FileMaker database that we keep track, kind of a standards-based reporting at OnCove. And we use Mac School for attendance and scheduling. Uh, at our middle school, we're using Mac School. And at uh, the high school, we're using a product, uh, Administrators Plus, from Redeker. So we have several different systems going on. Um, these, this little article about Student Information System talks about um, they've, they've evolved beyond what they were in the older days. Today's um, SIS, Student Information Systems, programs feature centralized architecture. Data does not have to be housed on separate servers in each school. That's our current situation. Three servers, three schools. Um, can ex be accessed by users in a single database via, via a web browser. They're, they're not platform dependent. They're not back for Windows. Uh, with a web browser, it's truly cross-platform. Uh, and some of these systems even allow uh, parent access to some of the information online. That's some, something that we would look at long term. Um, the system I'd like us to, to take a look at hopefully would have some of those characteristics. That it would be one, one system district-wide, centralized data source and server, um, handle all the things that we need it to do, schedules and attendance and um, grades, progress reports, all of those kinds of things. Uh, be be cross-platform, um, web-based, not platform-dependent, not uh, operating system-dependent. Dependent. 
I'd like us also to get a system that will track the learning results and do all of our other stuff in one place so we're not using one system to do learning results stuff and, and another system to do uh, our regular student information. So these are kind of all the things. And, and the last piece and the piece that you people were concerned about during budget deliberations last year is that we will need to be able to export the data from this system to MEDEMS, the main educational data management system, which is a system that the state is developing. Um, and this system we're looking at is is compatible and compliant with that. We will be able to get data out of that and export it into the state system. Uh, we're still discussing it. We had we had a focus meeting. The last DLT meeting was a focus meeting, looking at this piece of software for one last time. But we really didn't have time to discuss it. We're going to discuss it on the 24th. But if if the team decides to move forward, then we would just like your permission to, to move forward. The money is in the budget. It's not additional monies for that. So, any questions? We, we did have an opportunity to ask Gary questions um, prior to this meeting. Are there any other questions? No. Um, then I think um, Gary is looking for our approval. Um, on 924, if the administrators um, all agree to purchase this um, data management system, that they can go ahead and do that. So, do we have a motion? So moved. Okay. Second. Jennifer. All those in favor? Five zero. Okay. Now we'll move on to new business um, and there are recommendations for athletic fee positions for fall. Um, I present the following individuals for athletic fee positions. Um, assistant field hockey coach at the high school, Kate O'Toole. Um, seventh grade girls soccer, John Wise. And seventh grade boys soccer, Terrence Long. Um, do we have a recommendation to accept these athletic fee positions? Uh, Elaine? I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations for these athletic fee positions. A second? Second. Anne? All those in favor? Five, zero. Um, next is a recommendation to fill the co-curricular fee positions. And you have in front of you uh, a list of co several co-curricular fee positions, including um, some co-curricular positions at the high school, advisors at the high school, system-wide positions uh, who are mentors um, at all three levels for, for um, provisional teachers. Uh, so I would ask for your approval of this um, slate of co-curricular positions. Um. Is there a motion? Jennifer? I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation for co-curricular positions. Okay, second. Um, Elaine? Comments or questions? Kevin? I'll be splitting my vote. So do we have to take that separately? No, I don't think so. I think I can handle it without going through it individually. Okay. Um, all those in favor? I so you're voting in favor of this, the full slate right now, right? And, and I'm in voting, sure. voting in favor of the full slate except the nominee for freshman class advisor who I cannot at this point in time Accept the, uh, accept the recommendation on it. So rather than go through each one of the names? Make Excuse me? And rather than go through each one of them individually. Right. Or hide behind an abstention or vote against the entire slate. Okay. So do we vote on the, well, the motion is to vote on the whole list of people. So all those in favor? Four. All those opposed? One. And he's opposed to, to one individual on the slate. Okay. You okay. have that right, Mary? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, <coughs> next on our list is um, an approval to receive and spend all federal and state grants for the 2000, um, 2002-2003 school year. Um, should be a three. Right? Should be it should be 2003-2004. Yeah, we already spent okay. that money last year. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's my mistake. And the one before was not the 200. Well, I know I just changed okay. that one. Okay. Um, what you take an annual vote so that uh, as um, for federal and state grants as we receive them, so we just need a motion that we can spend the federal, state, federal and state grants that we receive. Have we received any yet? Well, we have. I mean, we've had approval. I don't know if we. Um, do we have motion to spend um, federal and state grant money? Kevin? I gladly move that we authorize the school district to receive and spend all federal and state grants for the 2003 and 2004 school year. Okay, and a second? Jennifer? All those in favor? Five, zero. Um, and last on our list is a request for a teacher for um, Family rearing leave? As per the negotiated contract, there is a request from Sonia Medina uh, for child rearing leave um, that would be for the remainder of this year, and she will be back in September. Okay. Is there a motion to accept this recommendation? Elaine? I move that we accept Sonia Medina's uh, request for uh, child rearing leave. For remainder of this year. Okay, and a second? Kevin? All those in favor? Five, zero. So that concludes um, our meeting for this evening, and I'll just go over some of the dates for future meetings. As Jennifer mentioned, the policy subcommittee meeting will be on Tuesday, October 7th at noon, here in the Jordan Conference Room. Finance subcommittee meeting, Tuesday, October 14th, 6.30, Jordan Conference Room. Our next um, regular school board meeting will be Tuesday, October 14th, 7.30, in the council chambers. And our school board workshop will be next week, Tuesday, September 23rd, at 7 o'clock. However, at 6 o'clock, we will hold um, a public forum on the um, building referendum. So we are you know, requesting that anyone who has questions, concerns, comments, um, come in the full school board will be there to um, answer questions. Um, and, uh, oh, there's a building committee meeting um, Thursday, October 2nd at 7.30. And there's one more. Oh, I'm sorry. There, there are two public forums, one which is prior to our school board workshop, and a second one will be the following morning at 10 o'clock um, at Community Services. And the school board, again, will be there to um, answer questions. And so we can adjourn this meeting. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn the meeting. Okay, and a second. Jennifer, all those in favor? Five zero. Do you have to make a motion?